Okay, great. Welcome, everyone. This is a meeting of the Northampton Board of Health. Today is 525. It is 533 p.m. Uh, we will be starting with public comment session. Is, is uh, someone, uh, one of our members, be willing to do a two-minute timer? Cynthia, you'll be ti our timer. Um, Suzanne, are you able to unmute? I want to make sure you're you're here. Ah, okay. Why don't you try again? There you go. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Um, great. Um, so I don't know if we have anyone here for public comment. If you're here for public comment, please raise your electronic hand, which is in the reactions section. Um, I think there was some confusion about what was on our agenda tonight. I just want to clarify on our agenda is um, a mask advisory and a communication plan that is not a mask mandate. And that is not a discussion of masks in the schools. Um, so I think there was some confusion um, among the school staff and others about that. Um, so I'm just clarifying that for the public. Um, and I do see two people with raised hands. Um, Greg, if you could uh, unmute, please. There you go. Yeah, hi. So we're not going to be talking about uh, masks, as, as John Provis had mentioned in his email. That is correct. He uh, was misunderstood what was on our agenda. Okay, so I mean, as far know, as schools, as far as schools go, yeah. So no discussion on on this. There's no impact. Nothing regarding schools in this meeting. Um, I can't guarantee that the topic won't come up, but it is not on our agenda for a vote. Okay, well, you know, I, I, I'd like to just chime in since I know that, you know, yourself, Joanne, as well as many committee members have been uh, guiding Meredith O'Leary on, you know, mask mandate and on, on various task force. Um, I, I think that it's time for the health committee to follow, follow science here. Um, our three-year-old son is at the town's Jewish preschool, and he's required to wear a KN95 95 mask, even outdoors on hot and summer days, days like we just had this weekend. Uh, their parents feel immense sadness, and without getting into the cognitive and developmental delays on this, uh, they're being robbed of their experience of laughing and smiling. My son also has asthma. He was with a two-month asthma attack and unable to breathe because of rounds of pregnizone. His pediatric pulmonologist said that his conditions were actually worse than COVID itself. The CDC, the EEC, World Health Organizations have never recommended masking for toddlers, yet there have been continued recommendations in here to mask our, our toddlers indoors and outdoors. I think that our leadership needs to take an opinion that aligns itself with science. Our six-year-old, who's in the Northampton Public School, has spent a year in isolation and now must develop his social and educational skills to carry him through life without being able to see his peers and teachers' faces. He has to learn to read and write without clear sounds and visualizations. Once again, the science is in. Because of ventilation, open windows, air purifiers, the effectiveness of one-way masking, school spread has been unproven, and John Provost went completely against literally trillions of data points of science to support this. Based on the spread Excuse patterns- Excuse me, but seeing, the time is up. Thank you. Um, Catherine? <coughs> Go ahead. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening, board. Uh, thank you for taking my comment tonight. My name is Catherine Potak, and I'm the parent of two children in Northampton schools. I'm a registered pharmacist, and I'm a co-founder of Mask Choice Pioneer Valley. 
I'm here tonight to make an appeal for transparency in regards to the process by which this board is contributing to the mandatory masking of our children in schools. The superintendent sent a, letter, sent a letter on Friday indicating that our children would continue to be masked at least until this board met again today, but did not share clear guidelines for off-ramping. When questioned, Director O'Leary was not able to provide any type of metrics at the last school committee meeting upon which off-ramping would occur. And your agenda tonight does not include any discussion or a possible vote of mask specific policy, um, even as a mask advisory. And as you all know, the public must be notified of any agenda items, discussion items and votes at least 48 hours in advance pursuant to the Massachusetts open meeting law. And I trust that this board would not deliberately violate open meeting law. So it's unclear exactly what policies would be discussed or implemented. Um, via masking that the superintendent would then be leading upon to impose continued mandatory masking. The public would like to know when we can expect an end to this mandate that is being imposed on our children and only our children who are the least at risk for COVID but the most vulnerable to negative repercussions of masking. The school district appears to be heavily reliant on the input of Director O'Leary and the SHAC committee. And as we enter the endemic phase of this virus, the Board of Health needs to consider what its role will be and how much our children and our children alone are expected to give up, quote, for the good of everyone and for how long. The public deserves transparency. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else here for public comment? Please raise your electronic hand. I don't see anybody else. All right, last call for public comment. Raise your electronic hand. I do not see anyone. Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate your comments. Um, so um, would someone like to make a motion to open our meeting? Move to open the meeting. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Joanne, yes. Um, thank you all. <clears throat> um, so this meeting is being recorded. Um, and uh, tonight we have all our board members present, Dr. Cynthia Swopis, Dr. Suzanne Smith, Dr. Laurent Levy, um, and Dallas Dukar. And we have uh, Department of Health staff, Amy Hutchins, Assistant Director, and Vivian Franklin, our public health nurse. Uh, am I missing anyone? Ellie. Is Kelly here? Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> welcome Kelly. Kelly Constantine, our clerk. Um, great. Um, okay, let's start with uh, a data update from Vivian. Thank you, Vivian. I think you're muted. There I am. Hello. Okay. Okay. Um, so I have a little bit of data to share. I'm going to try to move quickly um, in the interest of time. Uh, so Northampton, the past seven days, um, we're continuing on our increasing trend. Um, we have a, we had 160 new reported cases um, with an incident rate of 78 cases per day per hundred thousand. Um, our 14 day test positivity uh, just came out from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and that was 4.4%. Um, and that's a, but that's overall a 4.2% decrease uh, since the previous seven days. Um, it's too early to tell if that's a continuous decrease that we could be on, but we'll cross our fingers. Um, it, during our uh, home testing program, um, we received 12 new positive home test reports. Um, in the last week, we had uh, less than five hospitalizations that is suppressed to protect privacy and we had zero new deaths. Any questions about this slide? Just a quick question. When you get the reports of positive tests, are they official? Do you put them in our stats and send them to the state or not? The home tests? Mm -hmm. Nope, the state has no mechanism for reporting at home tests at this time. Okay. 
That's um, just for your so personal information. It's for our own local data surveillance. It's really just to supplement what we get more officially from the state labs. Okay. okay, for Hampshire County, this is sourced from the CDC and CDC gets all of our data from the state. So it's really sourced from the state. Um, so our seven day CDC testing data for Hampshire County, we had 723 new cases reported. Um, with a case rate of 450 cases per 100,000 people. So that is well over still our 200 per, um, cases per 100,000 threshold that puts us in the medium. Um, though I will say that's a 20.46% decrease from the previous seven days. So again, we did see a decrease, um, but I, I, it's too early to tell. Um, our percent positivity as a county is 6.42%, so a little bit higher than here in Northampton. Um, there is a lot of uh, higher ed and, and um, K through 12 surveillance testing that happens in Northampton that sometimes waters down our percent positivity a little bit. Um, as a county, we had 15 new hospitalizations that equates to 9.1 new hospitalizations per 100,000. So if that were to keep creeping up, we could hit that 10 new admissions per 100,000 threshold that would put us into the high community level. 6.7% um, of our staffed inpatient beds are occupied by COVID positive inpatients. Um, with 3.7% of our ICU beds hospitalized, I will say, I think locally and probably Dr. Levin could speak to this too, um, Kali Dickinson has seen an uptick um, in their inpatients um, with COVID-19. Um, and that was also a 42.5% 42, 42 increase in new admissions from the previous seven days. So very similarly to previous surges, um, that those hospitalizations do take some time to catch up with the cases. Uh, we are still, um, I think nationwide has seen this trend, we are still um, seeing very few deaths, which is part of the saving grace here. Um, we still have less than 10 um, deaths for the county for the last seven days. Um, and here on the right is a graph, really starting with March 1st to show how um, our cases went down quite a bit. And then we see us right here in May, um, experiencing this wave of cases that we're in. But we also see that our daily deaths are really quite low. Any questions about this slide? Okay. Okay, so I want to compare our two maps here. Um, on our left, we have our community levels, which that factors in our hospitalizations, as we know. Um, I mentioned that we are well past that 200 cases per 100,000 in seven days um, threshold. So we're sitting very comfortably in the medium still. Um, it's gonna take some time for us to get out of that and hopefully we'll continue to trend downward. Um, but for the time being, we are very comfortably there and our hospitalizations are playing catch up. So um, we could end up moving into the red. I can't see into the future. Um, it's gonna depend on what's ha happening with our hospitalizations over the next couple of weeks. Um, our community transmission is quite high. Um, and if you recall, back when our metrics were just about community transmission, to get into high, we just had, I believe it was just above, and now we haven't been using it for so, for so long, but just to be in the high transmission, we had to have over 100 per, um, cases per 100,000 in seven days. Um, so we are very, very comfortable in high transmission. And as we all know, um, cases are being underreported at this time due to lack of testing and home testing. Any questions about this slide? Oh, ready then. Okay. Uh, just a question, Vivian, sorry. Can you yeah. go back to the slide? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm just having trouble distinguishing between the two as oh. this seems to be a new graphic. Um, so on our left is our community levels. Um, and I did not put the, um, metrics or um, you know, the, the descriptors of what those are. On the left is the community levels, which factors in um, hospitalizations as well as community transmission. So I look okay. at both case, um, case counts um, and incidence of cases, as well as new hospital admissions and percent of beds um, occupied by COVID positive inpatients. On the right is only community transmission. So what's actually just going on with cases without factoring in hospitalizations. 
I think it's valuable to have a sense of both because as we know from um, what's going on in our hospitals and as our, what's going on in our schools as well is when we have high amounts of cases and high transmission, we end up having severe staffing shortages. Okay. So, Cynthia, just for reference, the, the chart on the right is what we call the old CDC metric. Okay. And then in, in February, they put out the chart on the left. Great. And then the yellow on the left, even though the medium isn't appearing on my screen as yellow, um, that, that indicates medium. Oh, yeah. If you have um, high exposure on your screen, that yellow might just get completely washed okay. out. Okay. Fair enough. That Thank you. Medium. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so here's a graph of our percent positivity um, comparing Hampshire County to the rest of the state. Um, Hampshire County was about 6% and the rest of the state is sitting at 8.58 um, or it's around up, you know, 9% positivity. Um, this shows a graph since the very beginning of our pandemic uh, back in 2020 for the state. Um, and this is just showing really since uh, March 5th of this year on the right for, um, on the left, excuse me, for Hampshire County. Um, just kind of giving you another image of what's going on. Any questions about this slide? I was just gonna say percent positivity is nice because it's not case rates. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a small amount of testing, um, you could still potentially use percent positivity. Um, assuming there's still a mix of symptomatic and asymptomatic testing going on. Yeah, and I, I think we have a better mix of that going on in Northampton between all the different educational programs, surveillance testing, um, but a lot more of the testing that's happening now, it's kind of like where we were at the beginning where a lot of the testing that's happening now is um, symptomatic testing, at least anecdotally from um, case investigation, it seems like people are getting tested in response to symptoms more than just being part of surveillance testing. Um, okay, and here's our wastewater. This was updated on May 18th. This is sourced from Biobot. Um, it's publicly accessible if you want to have fun learning about wastewater data, I encourage you to check it out, uh, biobot.io. Um, so here's where we were at on May 18th. This could be, um, a, I, I don't wanna make any promises, but this could be showing us a decrease in COVID activity um, with our wastewater, or it could just be a downward blip. You can see that even during the Omicron wave, there were kind of these downward blips um, that occurred. So uh, without having you know the next, data poll from, um, which should be out in the upcoming few days or, or a week or so. Um, it's hard to tell where, where that's gonna go. But again, I, I'm trying to be the optimist here and not uh, as I've coined myself, the public health Eeyore, okay? <laughs> um, so it could, it, it could be showing us that we're gonna see a decrease in cases and that would be, um, I think, the relief that we're all looking for. Um, any questions about wastewater? And wastewater, um, we have, I believe, three sites in Hampshire County, uh, UMass, East Hampton, and South Hadley, I think, are our three sites where they're getting um, wastewater collection. Um, and I always like every opportunity to share where you can find information with cases, you know, flying upwards still and um, a lot of home testing going on. We're really not able to um, get in contact with everybody who's testing positive, who's been exposed. Um, so there's a lot of good information here. You can find information on our COVID information page, um, as well as uh, mass.gov slash isolate for quarantine and isolation guidance. Um, mass.gov slash COVID treatment, if you're looking for um, COVID treatment options, if you actually have COVID. And mass.gov slash COVID telehealth is a new program where you can go online um, and get free telehealth and Paxlovid prescription if you are eligible. So really important and really good resources to have. Thank you so much, Vivian. Yep. Any other questions or comments about the data that Vivian presented? Cynthia? Um, thanks, Vivian, for those. Um, for the links, and I'm just wondering if we have experience that Paxlovid is being accessible for sure. That that this is that go to the doctor, go to the website. That we definitely have enough doses of Paxlovid. 
Um, at this time, there's supply. I know that there's concern that funding's running out and that supplies are running out and that's projected to become um, a, a potential problem. Um, so it's definitely on my radar, but at this time, people should be able to access it um, through their healthcare provider. Um, and then if they don't have healthcare provider, if they don't have insurance, um, this program that the state has COVID-19 uh, mass.gov slash COVID telehealth um, is free and does not require insurance. Um, they can do overnight delivery if you want, or they can have um, the prescription sent to your pharmacy um, for you to pick up. Overnight delivery is probably the better option for staying in isolation, but um, people are going to do what's um, best for their situation. Thank you. Yeah, my understanding is that there is ample supply and at least uh, our hospital is, is uh, continuing to recommend that people be treated and have a low threshold for being treated. But I know nationally, uh, because of this uh, new issue of rebound um, and poor, you know, bad taste in your mouth, that uh, there is some backlash and some physicians are not, um, not treating their patients with it. But the recommendations um, by the CDC and the state are to treat um, and it's a, it's the first, um, first drug of choice, um, <clears throat> for patients at higher risk. Thank you, Vivian. Can you unshare please? Thank you. Great. Anything else about that? Okay. Um, so, uh, last time we talked a little bit about the fact that, um, our cases are very high and that we strongly recommend that people wear masks and good quality masks. Um, and so we have drafted a um, health advisory about masking. Um, Vivian, is it possible for you to share that? And um, did you all receive that draft? I hope you did. The general one or the-, uh, the Number one, the first one, yeah. The one that Kate did, I think. Great. Um, so uh, are there any comments about this? Is um, this was this draft was based on the similar advisory that um, was um, put in place by uh, is, Cynthia was that the New York City or New York State Department of Health New York City I think no uh, it was the city and yeah. maybe if we could distinguish between the two because the distinguishing factor is at the end so which one are we looking at we're looking at the general mask advisory. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, any comments? Um, is this something that, um, is this what you had in mind um, <clears throat> when suggesting that we have a mask advisory? Uh, again, for the public, I wanna be clear, this is not a mask mandate and this is not specifically address the schools. I think in concept, um, this reflects what we discussed and at least what I had in mind personally. I, there are some edits I'd like to suggest if we go forward with this, but I think um, as a starting place, um, thanks for those who put the work into this. Um, it reflects at least what I thought we were discussing. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a good direction for us to go in. Um, I think we need to take the responsibility of educating our public. I think we're at a stage in this pandemic where um, um, advising versus mandate at this point, this stage um, is important. Um, 
And um, I think there are some finer details about how, you know, what we can do or not do. Again, this doesn't talk about the schools at all. Um, and so I just wanna make that point. And, um, you know, I, I would love to hear a discussion about it if we have some finer details. I, I would have recommendations about some other places such as City Hall as an example. It would be really nice if city government would um, adhere to this completely. Um, so yeah, those are my comments. Anybody else? Laura, you're muted. Um, I'm, I'm struggling with it. Um, because I'm not sure I would be wearing a mask tomorrow in the store. Um, and, um, and finding myself having to vote for an advisory where I would probably not follow through with it um, puts me in an odd place. Um, but I recognize this comes with good intentions. Um, the, the second issue that I have is, it's true that it's an advisory uh, as opposed to an order, but an advisory by the Board of Health will turn into an order for the schools. And, um, and that gives me a little bit of pause. And, and finally, I understand from Vivian that it's too early to tell, but I'm inclined to believe we're already in a downward trend. Um, if you follow the numbers a little bit, and by the time this is in place, um, this may have already become irrelevant. So that's where I that's where I stand as I read this. But again, I recognize this is all with good intentions, um, and I don't know how to best um, address the the need for people that are vulnerable should continue to wear a mask and, and, and protect themselves versus. We strongly encourage you to wear a mask and, and, you know, not probably not follow through with this for myself. Um, you bring up an interesting point, even though this is an advisory, I mean, the CDC can put out advisories and then organizations take that as um, something they need to do. Um, so that's a really good question. If this, we put out this advisory, does that mean that an organization such as the schools would feel that they need to follow this? But doesn't that give the organization the choice? Whether or not they want to follow it or need to follow it? I mean, we're not telling them to follow it. So I, I can give you an example in my work. Very often, we do not work from with regulation from states, we work with guidance documents, right? So guidance documents, that means you don't have to follow it, but in the end has force of we following it anyway, to the point that people forget that it was guidance in the first place. And that's what makes me a little bit nervous is that it gives um, someone the opportunity to rely upon an advisory to impose stricter rules. So is the range of options mandate, advisory, ignore advisory? That's what I'm trying to ascertain. What, what's the range, what's, what option are we looking for in this range or do nothing? I guess that's another option. I, I think all of the whereases always give an air of formality to these documents when they come out. Um, and based on this very interesting conversation, I, I think there are, there are two pieces to, to what I heard uh, Lawrence say. One was the, um, how it, the word advisory is interpreted. And as I said, all these whereases give this an air of authority. The other is the um, timeliness that he brought up. And we have had this issue through, 
throughout the pandemic of sort of chasing our tail. But by the time we can get things done, we're operating on um, outdated information. And that serves to um, add to the confusion and the misunderstanding. I was wondering if we could instead focus on something that is more generalizable and um, has some shelf life, which is to talk about the importance of masking for the people who are in high risk groups and those who live with them and make it a um, simpler, uh, clearer message and continue to, to make that clear to people because I think that's what's important. Um, we're interested in, in the data, we're interested in the ups and downs and I'm cautiously optimistic about the downturn. There are a couple of different data sources that are looking in that direction. But I don't want people to um, think that that means that we don't need to continue to take precautions. And we are probably going to have to advise people to take precautions if you're in a high risk group for a long time, like a really long time. I'm not, I'm not predicting that this is, this is a forever, but there, there is a, a probability that we are going to have to be dealing with blips for quite some time. So I don't think it's necessarily important for everybody in the city or visitors to city to be following the data as we are. Um, but I do, I, it doesn't matter to me whether um, this is a true dip or whether we're going to go back up again. It, it remains true that people need people who are at risk need to continue to engage in the measures that will protect them. And the most important of those is assuring that you are masking in higher risk situations and with the correct masks worn correctly. But isn't that what this um, advisory is suggesting? High risk and wear a mask and the correct mask. I don't know anyone who's going to go through all these whereases to get to those points. Vivian, uh, can so, you scroll down, please? <laughs> so it's the whereases that I think concern it's, you. It's the formality of it. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. People, people. Um, can you I go the, up a touch, I get, please? I get the same questions all the time from people. I also continue to now have COVID in my family, not in Massachusetts, but in my family for the first time. I know people who became positive after the Mount Holyoke um, graduation ceremony. I mean, I just keep hearing people over and over and over again becoming positive. People who were adhering to what they thought were um, appropriate measures, and yet they're now positive. They're surprised. They want information about it. They want to know what to do. And, and I'd like to do what we can to reduce um, the number of people who are exposed and become infected. And I think the way to do that is through simple statements that are repeated and that people can understand. And um, if there are a dozen people that read through this entire document, I'll be surprised. Vivian, could you scroll up just a touch so we can see like number one, can we, yeah, oh, with the, yeah. Highly recommend. So this document says that all individuals should wear a mask. This was sort of the next level up because we had so much <laughs> transmission. Um, this is not the general statement of high-risk people. Uh, we put that out a couple of months ago when I did that op-ed was about high-risk people should really wear masks and be very careful where they go and what they do. Uh, it was sort of a more general statement. Um, this, uh, based on what they did in New York City, was because they had a lot of community transmission, recommended that all individuals mask, like all those who can tolerate it or of age, et cetera, um, in indoor public settings. Um, 
personally, I, you know, I know there's a big debate out there about whether cases matter, right? If, if mortality is down, do cases matter? And I do believe that cases matter and community transmission levels matter uh, because they affect the functioning of all our systems. Our hospitals, our schools, our government um, affects all our systems, even if we don't reach the level of red by the CDC guidelines, because that only counts COVID cases. But when you have that much community transmission and you have so many people out of work, it affects the functioning everywhere, um, in addition to being harder to avoid. Uh, for those who need to avoid it. So um, I'd be in favor of, of this kind of advisory, suggesting that all individuals wear masks, um, but we would need to have an off-ramp if we decided to go this route. Dallas? That, that was exactly what I was gonna mention. I think if we're worried about how organizations will interpret this and the possibility of organizations individually mandating, then I think we should also consider, is there a time we would rescind this advice, whether for all people, um, or those that are not high risk and what that would look like, right? What that off ramp is, or if we're prepared to rescind that advice at some point. The advisory rather. I, I, I respect the importance of all of this. I think our on ramps and off ramps are very confusing to people. And I don't think we have the luxury of yes, no, yes, no on masks and hope that people understand that and act upon it in a way that we might hope. Cynthia? Yeah, so I, I guess there is the possibility um, as COVID is here to stay for a while. And so the discussion of an off ramp um, I think it's, uh, you know, we'll know it when we see it. We'll know when it's, if, if this were to be enacted, we would know when to lift it. But um, to, to come up with a, um, a criteria right now might be a little difficult for us. Um, but I'm wondering if, um, uh, if, if we agree that an advisory, whether it's, it's packed with whereases or not, is something that we should be doing right now. I just want to see, just take that temperature. And if the rest is, you know, wordsmithing, I, I appreciate the on and off ramping um, discussion. I'm just concerned that we're not in a place to know when or how to do that. Um, so I guess, I, I, Suzanne, you, I, you were talking about taking out the whereases, but we, would you agree that that an advisory is is appropriate right now? I think recommendations are appropriate. Um, you know, there. I think there's a reason that CDC went to a three color um, graphic to try to transmit information that was readily understandable, and we're at yellow now. And anyone who would look at that would, I mean, a whole lot of people would come away saying, what's, what's, go, what's going on here? What's the alarm? We're yellow. So all the, the measures are not consistent and, and are confusing. I think the ongoing recommendation needs to be to people who are at high risk of serious illness. And I think we can discuss whether, whether we, I don't think we have the data right now to support a change in um, our level of recommendation. And I think we need to keep it simple and we need to be consistent over the long run, unless there are major changes that cause alarm. I mean, if the, if, if, if the hospital um, gets really overloaded and it's due to COVID, not to other causes, but to COVID, 
and the hospital is severely short staffed, then that's something worth discussing, but we don't have information supporting that. So I would, I would stick to a simple public health message to people who are at high risk to engage in these measures for their own protection. I don't think we can get the attention of others at this point. But we have had a lot of businesses that have come forward and have had special hours for the high risk population. We've had businesses that say, in order to come here, you must be vaccinated and masked. We have businesses that are closing because of COVID. And so I'm just not sure, I mean, yes, protect the high risk individuals, but we still have the virus circulating amongst everyone. And so I just don't think it does harm to, to have an advisory of this nature. Are, are, are the episodes that you're discussing recent ones or are they throughout this, the pandemic? I think a little bit of both in terms of, um, I mean, we have the businesses that have, um, as to my knowledge, like some of the entertainment venues, I, I'll give the Academy, for example, um, they've gone back and forth, right? Um, they started vaccines and then they said no. And then I think they're at masks right now. I mean, what this does is it allows businesses, it allows establishments where the high risk population is engaging in to make a decision, to make a decision based on the information that we're giving them. And I'm not sure there's anything wrong with that. Is it the job of businesses to um, take added steps now to um, speak with people as they enter, to tell, tell individuals it's highly recommended that you wear a mask when they didn't arrive with a mask in the first place? Um, we're once again putting that responsibility on business owners. And in large part, these are people who desperately would like to move on. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't detect the acuity of the situation, Cynthia. That doesn't mean that my perspective is correct. It's just I don't, I don't see recent changes that lead me to believe that we should um, ramp up our recommendations. We have a lot of COVID and we have a lot of COVID transmission. If you can see from the wastewater and from our numbers, uh, it wasn't, uh, it's not as high as the original Omicron, although case numbers, you can't really rely on them. Um, but uh, we, um, we're in a surge. And, and from my point of view, that's, that's the reason to step up the recommendation to mask for all. But that's... That's not what I saw in the data that Vivian presented. Well, it's too early to tell if it's about to turn around, but even if it's starting to turn around, we are in a high, you know, and we're in a surge. So when we get halfway down that curve on our way out, maybe that's a time to make a change. But if you just start to see the beginning of the curve downward, doesn't mean you're in a good place. It just means you're in a, in a favorable trend. Um, but it does, you know, you're still in a high transmission place. So, so let me ask going forward, um, it's, there's a high probability that, that we will be having surges and decreases and surges and decreases going forward. And is it our intention to change our level of recommendations with each surge and then relax those recommendations as the numbers come down, is that what we envision doing going forward? We're going to be changing this um, based on surges. I understand there's high community spread, but we don't have the numbers that even would take us into red or orange under CDC metrics. 
So I, I just don't know how we're going to pursue this going forward. Well, I, from my point of view, the CDC metrics uh, were a good try, um, but they didn't quite anticipate that Omicron would lead to fewer deaths, but still a lot of uh, problems with uh, healthcare personnel and um, staff absences, and that's not accounted for in their metrics. Um, unfortunately, we don't have those metrics. That's not public data right now, um, but I'm considering writing a letter to my hospital as well as to the Department of Health asking them to make that a public metric, um, because I think when our, our society is not able to function uh, because of staff absences, it's not because of deaths, but because of absences, um, then we need to step up our, our interventions. And CDC, yeah. and CDC is what we have. I mean, that is the national authority. So that's what people look to. Well, I think in terms of our intentions and the CDC's intentions, um, this has been a real slippery slope. And um, we've been handed a lot of challenges every single time that we meet. I never would have intended we would have done some of the things that we did. I never would have intended um, Meredith would do some of the, um, uh, you know, revolutionary things that she did, like immediately set up a shelter for the homeless, for the houseless pop populations. So I can't, I can't say what our intentions are. I would hope that as we dip up and down the curve, this is an advisory that may be able to withstand that for a very long period of time. Um, but I don't know, you know, I just, I just don't know. And this is not a, a mandate where we were talking so many times about when we put the, the harshest policies in, what, what was our off ramp? And we just, we, we were reluctant to come up with that magic, magic statistics. And I'm so happy that things seem to be dipping, but that's a week's, a week's um, data. And um, I just am not sure what harm this would do um, if we put it in place, if the data goes up or it goes down. I, I just, you know, I think we can word it better. I think we can make it tighter language, yes, and maybe, if the whereases are the things that are getting in the way, but they do substantiate why we're coming up with this with this advisory. So I think they have some importance. We actually did a health advisory once before, and I can't remember what that one was about. I think it was very similar um, and not a soul paid attention. <laughs> but we did put it out. We put it on our website. The uh, media never picked it up. No one ever knew that we even did it. Um, so I don't really know how far this would get. Um, but you know, one of the things that we had talked about is a communication plan to to be sure that this got information got out. Um, but um, I have no interest in making a mandate. But I'll have to say that without a mandate. I think lots of people act as if there isn't a pandemic. You know, if they don't have to wear the mask and they're allowed to go without a mask, then they think it's okay and that government is telling them it's okay. I mean, I think it's an interesting phenomenon that a mandate not only mandates masks, but also gives this other message like something really important is happening. And without it, I'm not sure people get the message. Um, so this is sort of, I think our attempt to be sort of somewhere in the middle uh, to sort of give them the message without the mandate. Any thoughts on how to proceed? Well, I, I recommend that we do an advisory but I don't know if that's a, if there's a, a will to do that. <clears throat> and what would your advisory say? This document talks about all individuals, regardless of vaccination status or past COVID-19, wear a mask at all times, when indoors and in a public setting, including groceries, building lobbies, office stores, and common shared spaces. Um, yeah. Suzanne had proposed that we just have a sort of a 
blanket advisory that is just high risk people should should mask to protect themselves. Um, so that's two different ways to go, even within an advisory. I, I think it should be for all people, and I'm I'm reluctant to give you this anecdotal example, but I will. Um, about. 36 hours ago, I spent nine hours in our local um, emergency room, myself as a patient, um, nine hours. I do not know <laughs> the variety of patients that were there crammed in the halls and in the rooms. I do not know who had COVID or who didn't have COVID or who came in with one symptom versus another and then found out they had COVID. All I know is what I saw, nurses, doctors, cleaning folks, uh, AIDS, um, transport people. What I saw there was a hospital that was barely making it because of its vacancies. And its vacancies are often due, as I understand, to COVID. And a population, an age population that is under, under the, the highly vulnerable. Um, so I don't think this virus is discriminating. Yes, we have more individuals that are, are more susceptible than others, but um, I just, you know, the high risk population goes through many demographic categories beyond age. Um, it's individuals who don't have access, individuals who are afraid to access the hospital system. And I, I don't know if I'd ever wanna go into that experience again, if I were as ill as I, as I was, I'm better, I'm all good, everything was fine. But, um, <laughs> You know, it's, a, it's just a very limiting and profound experience to know that we're in this situation because of COVID, okay? And I just think we have to think a little more broadly than protecting, and I wanna protect the high risk, highly, um, high risk population. But every, um, this is the first time, you know, I remember three, two and a half years ago when I knew no one who had COVID. Now we all know people who have had it and it's been in our family. So um, I'm just an advocate for saying um, all individuals. Anybody else? It would be helpful to have data from the hospital about their staffing situation over time to know if we are in a period uh, that is newly urgent, or whether this ha is a um, is an ongoing issue that we've had for two years or more. Um, data data to support whether whether we have these staffing situations, whether in their schools or in hospitals or the 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 critical personnel. Um, is it is it a problem right now so that we need to act a different problem, a new problem, or is this ongoing? I don't know. Um, I have some sense of it, but I don't have the data to support it. Yeah, unfortunately that's not public data right now, but if uh, <clears throat> you'd like, I will write a letter to our hospital and hospital system, as well as Department of Health uh, in Boston, suggesting that Departments of Health, local departments of health need this information uh, to sort of assess what's going on. Um, <clears throat> I know we do have a healthcare worker shortage that even predated uh, the pandemic, uh, but staff outages, staff, staff being out because of COVID significantly exacerbates that situation. Um, and it, that's obviously true at the schools as well. Um, uh, but we, yeah, I agree. We we don't have the data. I mean, I can just, you know, it's my experience, but I I, I can't share any particular data. Um, and the state hasn't been putting that out either. Um, I think the state has to do it because no hospital wants to be singled out. So hospitals submit their data to um, the state, then the state can put out sort of more general information. Um, so that would be what I would advocate for. Um, but when the, the pandemic is having an effect on the functioning of our society, I think that's where we need to intervene.
Any other thoughts on how to proceed? Is anyone interested in making a motion? I, I just wanted to add something is I, I do hear obviously the distress that Cynthia experienced at the emergency room and, and but I, I can't help wondering and I think you touched upon this, John, that it's it's not necessarily an issue of, um, I, I, it's just an issue of lack of staff, and lack of hiring, which I am experiencing in my company and less so of COVID, at least, you know, um, among our staff, some have had COVID and certainly it's had affected us somewhat. But I think the bigger issue we having, and I assume, although I'm not sure that could be the experience of the hospital, is this the lack of people available to work at the moment. We can't find qualified candidates. Um, and and my, my sense is sh the shortage that we see now is, is, is not directly a consequence of this wave. I may be wrong, but I, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced. No. Um, that's not my impression. I mean, I think we have both things going on. We had a healthcare worker shortage prior to the pandemic, but every time we've had a wave, we have a high number of staff out with COVID, which means they have to be out a minimum of five days and often as long as 10 days, which is very long um, for critical healthcare workers. Um, and, you know, obviously being short staffed to begin with um, just makes that all that much harder. I mean, we've heard of things called the great resignation. I mean, there's reasons not to even go into healthcare now. <laughs> so I, I, and that's, I know that's anecdotal and we're, we're all talking about anecdotal things here, but um, I, I don't know, I'm trying to connect the dots and um, I do not see any harm in taking a leadership role in our community, putting out an advisory. I just do not see the harm in it. And um, this is about doing no harm, right? And so I'm just, I'm, I mean, I'm ready to make a motion um, unless someone can, you know, provide just a rationale as to why this is, is harmful or why um, this doesn't do any good, or maybe we think nobody will read it, or maybe nobody will pay attention to it. But what harm does it do? I, I think I fall back on my earlier argument of one being timing of, um, is, is this a little late considering that, it, it, I don't know, but it seems that things are going down to, okay, are we kind of crying wolf? Because are we going to have something that's more severe down the road when the next wave happens? Um, and, and, and therefore, well, uh, well, we did an advisory here, um, so we got to have to do a super advisory for that next surge, or we have to resort to mandates. So maybe we have to come up with some, some sort of intermediate. Uh, and three is, um, <laughs> at a personal level, I'm not even sure I would follow through with this advisory. Fair um, enough. Fair enough. <laughs> well, I guess the question is, um, do you believe this is the right advice that we should be giving from the board? Whether you follow through individually or not? I, I, I do think we, I'm, I'm sensitive to the comment, the public comments that I've heard <laughs> that, um, it's true, it doesn't do any harm from a COVID perspective, but we don't seem to often weight the impact that this has on the school system where everyone's masked. And now we're starting to have individuals, children that have never seen their staff done mask after all those years, going to school and they've never known school without masks. Um, and it's very hard to quantify that impact um, and I can help thinking, I, I, wish, I wish there was some, um, I wish we took into account the psychological impacts that this has. 
Uh, ultimately, a mission is to prevent death um, and serious harm. And obviously, I'm sensitive to the argument of we also need to make sure that society keeps functioning. Um, but I'm not entirely that society convinced that society is not functioning. I've done my share of emergency room visits uh, where there was a painful wait, even though I was in pain and nothing was happened. That was back in 1999. It was like that then. Um, I've gone recently to the emergency room, not for me, uh, but certainly I did not see anything that was telling me that things were not working as, as they should. Now that was a month ago, things may be different now. Um, but again, I, I'm, I think, you know, society is not working perfectly, but it's not working poorly either. So, but we're not talking about schools, Laurent. And so I have to go back to what harm is this advisory doing? Well, I think that advisory um, is heard as an advisory to the city, but it's later on used as, a, um, um, as oh, well, you see Border Health has issued an advisory, so we're gonna make a mandate for the schools because we're just gonna go one notch further um, and here we are. So I was not aware that school had uh, reinstituted a mandate until I saw that, um, that whereas in the text. Um, Would it be helpful if we added um, a line that says decisions around school masking should be made by school professionals and with guidance from the Department of Health? I mean, that is how we've been handling that. We have not intervened with the schools um, because we're not school professionals. Um, would that be helpful? I have to think about it. My question would be helpful to whom? Um, there, I just don't see people reading this or taking the time to sift through it and understanding the nuances. Um, I, I agree with Lauren that it's just advisory is heard is heard different ways to different people. And it has some authority if it's inherent to the word that we may not assume is there, but others may. And I just don't know who's going to read this and act upon it, um, especially when we're, we're talking about something that's community-wide and the interventions need to be community-wide if they're gonna have any effect. I, I think that it's, I just don't think it's going to have the effectiveness that we would hope. I think that in addition to an advisory um, where we might also say this does not specifically apply to certain groups such as schools that are overseen by school professionals or DESI or whatever, um, we were going to make a communication plan. And when we have this document, um, we can then make a plan for how it gets put out in perhaps simpler language um, as an op-ed, as a press release, as um, an interview. I mean, they're all different ways as it go on the telephone into the Northampton telephone system. We had talked about these various options on how to sort of spread the word in an easy, easily accessible way of what our recommendations are with this document being the formal writing of the recommendations. I, d I just think in the history of public health, um, you know, I think of tobacco, I think of condoms with the a HIV crisis. 
I think of all the measures that have been put into place. Will people really do it? Will people really listen? Will people, and we know that there's going to be a certain end or a certain population that does not heed um, a public health message, but there are going to be people who do. I believe that. And um, I, I don't think I'd be in this business if, if I didn't. And I just feel that without doing this, we're doing nothing. We're doing nothing. And I just feel that we need to take a leadership role on this. And so even if not a single person in this community reads it or cares about it, um, which I don't think is gonna happen, I think we need to, to do something of this nature. <clears throat> Any other comments? I, I like the analogy, but I also think that um, the use of condom and, and smoking are things that are not coming, do not come in waves. Um, and these are, you know, things that are a little bit more permanent in nature. I think this beast is a little different because it's a surge that happens sometimes. And um, I, I, I'm just unsure how to handle this. That's why, that's all. Well, we, we still have smokers and we still have people who acquire AIDS. Mm -hmm. We just happen to have vaccines now and we happen to have more public knowledge and we happen to have less stigma. Um, so um, this is all progress. Mm -hmm. um, and we have less smokers, but we continue to raise another generation of smokers. So um, I, I think just walking away and saying no one's gonna listen is, um, well, it's not a strategy, but it scares the hell out of me. So I think we need to do something. Dallas? Yeah, I've been, I think I've been going back and forth on this a lot. And, you know, I think when we think of what we do know, we are able to at least see percent positivity. There are some fluctuations there, but it's probably a better metric. I think it's hard to tell if the staffing is causation or correlation entirely, um, but maybe more data there will be helpful. Um, and, I, and I keep kind of coming back to this idea of metrics, but then I also think about what Lawrence said in terms of preventing death. And I would say that, you know, one death is still a, a tragedy. Right, and if our duty is to prevent death in whatever way, then even if there's three to one deaths, it's still a tragedy due to COVID. And if we're advising rather than mandating, then it seems like the benefit is the possibility. I and mean, we don't know the probability of someone reading this or not, but the possibility of at least preventing another death. Um, without necessarily restricting life, restricting daily activities so much so because we're not mandating, we're advising. So if we're weighing the costs and benefits here, there's the possibility of saving a life as a benefit. Um, maybe the cost is some additional public confusion on the difference between advisory or mandate. But I think the prevention of death seems more important than the possibility of that confusion or people not reading it, even if it's one death. Anybody else? Does anyone want to make a motion? I'll give it a, I'll give it a try. Um, I move to issue an advisory for protecting, for further protecting the public against COVID. Do you want to comment on this particular advisory? Is this what you would? I, I think, um, I think we need to, I'm, I'm making the recommendation to have an advisory as opposed to um, 
-hmm. doing the wordsmithing on, on this particular one or not. Do you want to uh, elaborate a little bit more about what your advisory would include? Um, I, I personally have no issues with the advisories that have been presented to us um, and I wouldn't change them. So that's why I wanna leave a little room for discussion. <laughs> um, my motion uh, is focused on um, issuing advisory, this Board of Health issuing an advisory on um, um, further protecting the public against COVID. Any, uh, is there a second? I, I would second it. Great. Is there any uh, any more discussion? We can also take friendly amendments to uh, talk about the language. Any other discussion? So Cynthia, I'm a little confused about your um, your motion is that we do put out an advisory, but you don't want to declare what the advisory would say. Um, I'm happy to amend the motion. Okay. If, if that's what if you're needing, um, if that's what you need, Joanne. Well, I guess there's a, two different kinds of advisories. So Suzanne earlier talked about an advisory for high risk people, and this one, as written, talks about masking for all. The, uh, the it's a great point, and so I can amend the motion to say that I move to issue an advisory for um, all individuals for protecting the public against COVID. And I am fine with the language that has been presented here, but we might want to change it. Mm -hmm. You know, the whereases, or if that's mm -hmm. if that's of a concern. So I know that's a pretty sloppy proposal here, <laughs> pretty sloppy motion. So it sounds like your motion uh, is that uh, you're supporting an advisory for all people um, um, to be protected against COVID. And I'm assuming you're saying masking, a masking proposal? Yeah, is, isn't that is, in? Well, that's not what you, you didn't say that. You said protecting the public. Um, to, to include masking. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, definitely. Um, okay. So your proposal can be sort of a general proposal with some changes to the words, like we've done that before with Meredith. Um, yeah. We change the words to fine tune them. Yes. Um, any other discussion? Is there, is there a reason why we would consider all individuals instead of recommending one-way masking for high-risk individuals if we know that one-way masking works? Um, from my point of view, one-way masking works better than two-way cotton masking, but when all are masked, it works even better. Um, so one-way masking is not a hundred percent, um, mm -hmm. and, um, I suspect a lot of high-risk people are already using better masks and one-way masking, and yet we still have, we're in the middle of a surge. Any other comments? I, I want to make sure Dallas, um, cause I know Dallas. Mm -hmm. Had, had a question about the one-way masking and that that there's, and you and Dallas, you, you seconded the motion, but I wanna make sure you're comfortable with um, this other discussion that we've been having. And so maybe, so maybe we should just really specify that motion a little clearer. Does that make sense? Or are you comfortable with seconding the motion, the mushy motion that seems to be on the table right now? No, I, I, I'm so, I was just more so raising the question just to make sure that I think we were clear there, but I'm comfortable seconding the motion. Okay, thank you. I just, yeah, thank you. 
Any further discussion? All right, I think we've come to a vote. Um, we'll have a roll call. I'll do it by who's on my screen here. Um, Suzanne? No. Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? I'm going to abstain. Oh, that's a problem. <laughs> Uh, Dallas? Yes. And I do believe that I vote. Um, and I will vote yes. So we have three yeses, one no, and one abstention. So that I believe the motion passes. Um, thank you, everyone. That was really difficult. Um, Um, Cynthia, you had thoughts about how to wordsmith this a little bit. Um, I think you may need to work with uh, Amy or Meredith when she's back. Um, but I think um, sort of keep to, uh, because we voted on it, we'll keep the intent of the language. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, Vivian, are you okay to stick around a little longer? Or you want me to pull up my, uh, for the second motion, for the second draft? So um, this is something that I drafted. I basically took the same whereas is, um, and I just, and we don't have to have those in there. Um, but I did want to add one point about 3% um, of the American population is moderately to severely immunocompromised, and um, Vivian calculated that at least 19% of the population is over 65 years old and considered high risk. Um, so this was a draft, if you could go up just a little more, please, um, of um, a recommendation, again, not a mandate. Um, sort of a request from pharmacies and uh, grocery stores that they have <clears throat> all masking hours, uh, mainly Dallas for the same ideas that one way masking with a good mask um, is good, but um, there are still people who don't feel comfortable with that. And we know that when all are masked, it is more effective than one way masking. Um, so this is really just asking these businesses that, that provide essential services, um, to have at least an hour a day in some reasonable hour between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. where everyone in the store masks um, and that they would have to, it's sort of a hassle, but they would um, make sure that that happens, the staff as well as the patrons. Um, can you go up a little more, please? So we can see that, oh, the other way, <laughs> sorry, down. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it just says, it's highly recommended that all pharmacies and indoor food markets, excluding convenience stores associated with gas stations. I just didn't know a way to sort of separate convenience stores from groceries. Um, provide at least one hour per day between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. where everyone in the public space will be masked. This includes, for example, pharmacists interacting with a person uh, in person with the public, clerks, shelf stockers, patrons, but does not include, for example, people working in back rooms and offices where the public doesn't go. An appropriate signage should be posted to alert the public and workers and management should make every reasonable effort to have the public and workers comply. Um, any thoughts about that? We had talked about it briefly last time um, and it was suggested that this not be a mandate, but this be a recommendation. You know, I think it's fine. I just don't know if, you know, specifying people in the back rooms, um, <laughs> you know, uh, since we're uh, um, um, making this an advisory. <laughs> I don't know if we have to be so specific about the folks in the back rooms, but that's just a, just a thought. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I've heard from lawyers to be as specific as you can okay. and, and, you know, so that people are not confused about what counts or what doesn't count. 
Um, okay. I think Meredith looked at this briefly and thought it was okay, but I could run it by Alan Seawald and see if he thinks it needs more specifics or less. Um, this is really, again, you know, I don't know if we want to call it an advisory or a request or a recommendation or or what. It's not really a health advisory. It's really a request to these businesses. And this would be in addition to the first draft. Yes, this okay. is, yeah, I envision this as being sort of a longstanding thing. This is how we live with COVID. We accommodate yeah. our immunocompromised folks best we can and without a big, uh, undue hardship on the rest of the population. Um, that's how I see this. I, I also think it's a good way of framing it for any communication we have afterwards, how we live with COVID mm -hmm. um, is a good way to sort of put this out. Any comments? Cynthia, I like how you, you phrased that because I, I see this one is different than the first one. Um, this, I do believe, um, stands the test of, of what do we do going forward? This, it's also, it's also a relatively new message that people haven't heard over and over and over again about masking. Um, it draws attention to a group, I believe, Joanne, you're the one that, that raised this at last meeting that this is a group that people seem to have forgotten about, which is those who are still frightened to, to go out in public, go to public spaces, public indoor spaces, and they feel that they have been overlooked and forgotten. So, so this I see as um, different than the first one, and um, I have a different perspective on this one. So I would support something like this, um, just because it, it's a message that hasn't, it hasn't been put forward enough. Any other comments? Does anyone want to make a motion? I don't think I can make a motion as chair. Sure. I move that we, I can't go up, I'm not controlling that screen, but I believe, I think I printed this out. I believe that this is a, um, I support a, a motion to accept the public health advisory to accommodate those at high risk of uh, complications from COVID, having at least an hour a day in certain establishments where everyone will be masked. Is there a second? I'll second. Who was that? That's Dallas. Okay, great. Any other discussion? This is specifically written for pharmacies and food markets, uh, thinking that they're essential services. Um, any other comments, Cynthia? I just want to clarify that this is in, in addition to the first draft. I just want to clarify that. It's not a yes. replacement of in, in addition to. Okay, thank you. This is, uh, the title says public health advisory number two. Any other comments? Um, I guess one question is, should we call it a public health advisory or a request? to businesses and like mail it out as a request or that, you know, should we keep this format? That would be a question for Meredith and others. What's the most, what have they found to be the most effective method of communicating 
with businesses like this. I mean, I, I don't have any problem calling it an advisory at this point because that does not dictate um, the specifics of the language and, and the communication strategy. But what, 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 what's worked in the past, that, that's a line of communication that's operating all the time. Amy, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, there's been um, other, I guess, like memo memorandums that we've sent, emailed um, to businesses. Um, I was just trying to think of how will we know they're participating? Like, how will we gauge how many of so many are participating? And like, that's how I, I've been thinking as you, as you guys discuss it. Um, but I believe emails um, do work. They think people don't check their emails. So there's that. So it's an email and a mail possibly. I think if we wanted to see who's complying, we'd give them a month or two. And then we have a limited number of pharmacies and limited number of grocery stores. I think we could probably figure that out and spend a few hours checking. Um, but we can let the Department of Health figure out how, how it's best communicated. Um, any other comments? We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? I, I think that in terms of the, the timing on that is also going to be interesting um, and we'll see. I, again, I, I, re I recognize it's an advisory, but this, um, this will probably be continuing past any surge since, um, and, and that's something that we'll have a hard time lifting. And I don't know if we can lift uh, so if I'm a business owner, I will start asking myself, well, if I put this in place now, when I will remove it. Uh, so I might as well not put it in place because it seems to be something that could last eternally. Um, so again, I, I, I'm, I'm, we'll see what happens, how effective it is. And um, I, I don't have a good substitution. I recognize this. I don't know how to best approach this. Um, um, I'm just curious to see how it's going to work and whether it's going to be, if, you know, implemented. Well, we could keep it on our agenda um, as old business, like we've had the other mandates as old business to sort of revisit and review, whether it's every meeting or just periodically. Um, I'm happy to do that. Any other? comments maybe my second comment is um maybe we will end up with a number of people that actually want to be exa going exactly at that hour considering themselves as safer uh, if they go within that window so that might create uh, um, a possible rush at a particular hour of the day uh, again you know i don't have a crystal ball um just be running an experiment here. Well, as I mentioned last time, I actually talked to one of the managers of River Valley Market uh, in East Hampton, but they did the same thing in the Northampton store. They have um, ma masks for everyone uh, from the hours of 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. every day. Um, and they have a cute little sign out outside with their logo, the little bear. It's very friendly. Um, and I asked the manager, um, what their response has been from their, their patrons. And they said about 90% were really happy and thanked them for doing it. And 10% were really grumpy. So to me, that sounds successful. Any other, we have a motion on the table with a second. Any other comments? Okay, uh, I think we'll ask for a roll call uh, vote uh, on the motion um, to have a public health advisory to accommodate people who are at high risk of COVID to have at least one hour a day uh, where everyone is masked for in uh, certain locations. Um, Suzanne? 
Yes. Dallas? Yes. Laurent? I'm going to abstain. Uh, Cynthia? Yes. And Joanne? Yes. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, and I can work with Meredith or our um, attorney to look at the details of the wording. Um, great. Um, next on our old business is ventilation task force update. Uh, Amy and I met with um, Josh, Josh, well, let's see, Josh didn't make that meeting, but uh, thank you, Vivian. Um, uh, Rick Peltier was there and we are on our way towards um, uh, creating a PowerPoint education uh, about the importance of ventilation and how one would modify their ventilation if they were interested in doing that. Um, so we have a general outline and then graphics will be added and we will all take a look at that. Um, so we'll meet again in a couple of weeks. I hope to have it ready to go for our next meeting, but I can't guarantee that. Um, and then we'll work on coming up with a list of places where we want to uh, do that educational um, review um, that would include uh, the Downtown Business Association or the, I know it's the Chamber of Commerce that has sort of an ongoing uh, lecture series. Uh, we would certainly bring it to the Board of Health. I'm not sure exactly how we would bring it to the city councilors and the mayor. Um, we could ask them about that. Um, and then maybe have a, a forums where we um, bring it to the public um, as well. Um, any other comments or um, uh, questions about uh, ventilation? We also looked into the ARPA money and there will be a very slow process for applying for ARPA money for ventilation. Um, the mayor has put together a group of people who are going to be helped define the process and then there'll be something we will have to submit. Um, so I think it will not be a quick fix and I doubt that anything would happen by the fall. Um, which is unfortunate, um, but at least we can start the education and try to get people up to speed on knowing what, what the issues are with ventilation. Any other suggestions or comments? Uh, other than thank you, Joanne, for doing that, because this, this could be a real game changer for the future, and it's too bad that, you know, but we, we have to take this a step at a time, and so the, maybe not for the fall, maybe the spring, but... Um, it's just a good practice to have good ventilation in, in all our indoor places, so thank you. Yeah, I've also been talking to Meredith about uh, doing sort of a review of the indoor spaces that the city uses, particularly uh, with the public. Um, and she did say she thought that there were HEPA filters available for people to put in their offices, but she's not sure if there was any sort of systemic evaluation of those spaces. So um, city hall and, Council chambers are very old buildings without any ventilation, right, Amy? Yeah. So, um, so we'll pursue that as well. We, you know, I'd certainly be in favor of our city being a um, a model for for uh, putting in good ventilation. And you know, in the older buildings, it's not going to be central air for hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's going to be HEPA filters where it's where they're needed, um, likely. Um, okay. Um, Next topic, um, I do believe this will be Lawrence's last meeting. We're very sad to see you go. Um, so we have, we will have a vacancy um, on the board. And I know we did write a job description um, a few years ago. I don't have that in front of me. A few, um, months. A few months ago, because Cynthia and I worked on it recently. It's probably more than a few months, but whatever. Wait, so we did. We do have a relatively recent um, job description, and we have talked in the past about a diversity being an important um, component of someone that we'd be looking for. Um, so I did talk to the mayor's office, and I asked them to sort of post it and make sure that it was posted in the various places that needs to be posted. Um, the mayor will probably ask Meredith for advice about what we are looking for 
Uh, do we want to talk about that anymore? Uh, we've been talking a long time about diversity and so um, and uh, whatever we can do in those efforts, I think would be very advantageous for us. Um, is there someone with that? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it, and it's it's difficult. I'm on a couple of other committees that are trying to expand its diver diversity, and um, uh, there are good ways and bad ways of doing it. So I hope uh, you know. I hope we can think through that. Um, but um, I also hope that we can fill the vacancy and stay focused on it, as opposed to having the long drought <laughs> that we had before D Dallas came here. So um, those are my feelings. Um, and I also found out, um, actually, shout out to Dallas because I heard an NPR interview with you this morning. Um, and I did, I, one of the things that I felt that we really needed was a mental health person. And I think you have that background too. So that's, that's as I heard in the interview anyway. <laughs> so um, I think that that's a great, a great component for this board as well, particularly since we're going well that the health department is going to be taking on the DCC so so in, in I looked at the past communication the job description we put together was around May 2021 so it's exactly a year ago so it's <laughs> not many years but <laughs> more than a few months yes seems like yesterday yeah yeah um so are there um we have two <laughs> physicians um and a nurse are there any particular skill sets that um, we would want someone to have? Um, Laurent is a, you're an engineer? Yes. Yes, and previously we had someone who, um, Bill was what, worked for OSHA, he was an engineer as well. Um, are we looking for a skill set for someone to have skill set different from what others of us may have? Joanne, I recall seeing um, some applications for the position that Dallas has filled. Thank you, Dallas. Um, there were some intriguing folks in there. Uh, I wonder if, if that group of applicants, since they've expressed interest, could be revisited. And I recall from looking at that list that there were folks who had backgrounds I wouldn't have thought of who had interest in, in participating in the Board of Health. So I'm hesitant to, to put my opinion out there about what skill set is, is necessary other than an interest in serving and an interest in, in a population-based approach to health. Um, because there are people out there who have perspectives that I think would be really intriguing to, to have um, um, among our group. I think sometimes healthcare can also be a little bit of a, a silo too. And I really appreciated hearing some of Lauren's um, advice and thoughts and commentary on the world outside of being in a clinic or a hospital. And um, I think that offers a very useful perspective personally. I, I can't hear you, John. I, sorry, I did encourage the mayor's office to put out um, that we have a vacancy, but I think they still do have those previous um, applications. Um, so um, we'll ask them to sort of move forward with that. <clears throat> um, anything else? Any other comments about that? Thank you. Uh, the only other thing we have on our agenda um, are minutes. Uh, let's see. Did everybody have a chance? to look at the minutes, I can pull them up. Um. Last chance, Laurent, last chance. They were perfect <laughs> though. I had one in it though. Oh. 
Jeez. <laughs> Let me bring it up here. Uh, where is it? Can you see it? Where'd it go? Oh. Now do you see it? Yeah. Yep. There we are. Okay. Uh, Lauren, you had um, a change on here? Um, the only change I had was in under number three, second bullet. Yep. Um, it was the last sentence, presentation will be made. Yep. That's it. It was otherwise perfect. Mm -hmm. We don't use that word in our house. <laughs> <laughs> Um, any uh, other yes, comments? I, yeah. I think someone coming from the outside and reading this, these minutes would not know who Professor Rich Peltier is or Josh Yearsley. Could we put their affiliation? And Good point. Why they're, why they're on this, this task force? We, not why, but, but their, their, their position and, and uh, expertise they bring. Is, I mean, is Professor Rich Peltier, is that a UMass professor of something? Yeah, I have to figure out what he's a professor of. Well, he is. air quality. Isn't he? Mm. He's an um, um, air pollution guy. Yeah, but what okay. department? Like, <laughs> Let's put that in the minutes. <laughs> department of, of air pollution, pollution guy. Yeah. School, of public, <laughs> school in public health and health sciences. OK. Uh, is he really? That's what oh, I was okay. on the UMass site. Okay. Public Health and Health Sciences. And Josh. And Josh is just a volunteer. He uh, does not have any particular credentials in this area, um, except that um, he's a guy who for his work takes complicated information and tries to simplify it for people's understanding so i don't know how i put that in the minutes is he a community member joining community, community volunteer yeah uh, uh, does he live in northampton mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, he, I, I guess really he doesn't good. doesn't really have to but yeah community volunteer might do it yeah okay and so the enthusiastic community volunteer <laughs> <laughs> All right, how's that? Cool. Um, anything else? This is going to be a moot point um, in, a, in a very, in just a matter of minutes. But I think at the top under members present that the, the and should go after Laurent and before Dallas. That should be the semicolon there. Okay. Perfect. Two. Anything else? You're welcome. I don't know if you want to put NP after my name. You don't. Oh, yeah. Yes, I'd like to. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Um, any other comments about the minutes, edits? Would someone like to make a motion? I move to accept the minutes from uh, May 12th, 2022 with uh, uh, corrections discussed. Second. Great, any other edits, comments? All in favor? Let's see everybody. Uh, Cynthia? Yes. Uh, Laurent? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. Um, OK. Um, our next meeting dates. We had discussed last time meeting next on our monthly schedule on June 23rd. Does that feel too far away? Or does that feel right? 
Are we, um, if once we make edits to the health advisory, do we need to look at it again or um, are we just going to issue it? I think if we're making minor edits in language, um, we don't need to see it again. I mean, I think if we all wanted to see it again, it would really delay uh, yep. it going out. Okay. Is everyone okay with that? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of getting, you know, uh, the weekly updates from Vivian, will we be able to just kind of dial in ourselves and just say, how's it going? Um, I believe Vivian posts um, the Northampton numbers once a week, I think on Thursdays. Okay. So you can see those numbers there. The CDC numbers, the CDC has a page with that graph of the picture of the United States. Yes. And then this drop down menu, you can see the two different metrics, the community spread and the community levels, I think they call it, the yeah. one that's all red, and the one that's where the yellow inside the red, those are both on that same page, just sort of different way of looking at that graph. Uh, wastewater, you can go to Biobot um, and see that. Um, but maybe we, um, I think Vivian left, I could ask Vivian to put those on her, um, to modify her dashboard to include those things. Because those are good metrics to see. The two CDC maps and by about wastewater and percent positive. Put those on there. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, we're usually the third Thursday. For some reason, I think we had to change where so the 23rd is the fourth Thursday of June. Does that work for everybody? I think we had said it does, unless you need feel like we need to meet earlier. Yep. Okay with everybody. So we had said June 23rd, July 28th. And a tentative August 18th, though sometimes we don't meet in August. We would make a decision about that closer to the date. Those dates work for everyone? Yep. Mm -hmm. I believe we dealt with the conflicts last meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So we're good for now. And maybe next meeting we can uh, go into the fall. Um, okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And good luck to you, Lawrence.